capitalism, all of the gains in automation, it goes to the owner class. All you have to do is have everyone be an owner, and now suddenly, any gain in automation is a gain for everybody. If you grow just one thing, it may not grow as well as if it grows with another thing. A good example of that is called the, the Three Sisters Method of Farming. There is definitely multi-apartment buildings or multi-families that do do a passive A hundred million dollars that they gave to Joe Rogan that they would kind of be out if they bring is that a bigger number or is two billion a bigger number i don't know Sam. it's a tough one it's i know really hard and maybe maybe yes. comparing numbers is not uh jeremy strong gotta go kill a jenny i still don't think you should kill her i don't think it's a good idea it's a ghost dude welcome back everybody to bread theory so tonight we are going to continue on with our reading of alexander berkman's what is communist anarchism also known as the ABC of Anarchism. Uh, it was published under several titles for whatever reason. But anyway, uh, we are we have just gotten through the sections that, that detail his experience with the Russian Revolution. He was quite disillusioned with the whole process. He thought the Bolsheviks had a lot of great ideas and a lot of great ideals going into things. Uh, but then for one reason or another, they continued to justify not giving back power to the people, not forming a true dictatorship of the proletariat, but having basically the vanguard party hold on to power indefinitely. And there was, and, and, you know, to be fair, Alexander Berkman does not provide this context, but there were assaults on the USSR from its inception. Uh, shortly after uh, World War I, the U.S. and other allies tried to invade um, the, the newly formed country of the USSR to overthrow uh, the Bolsheviks, and uh, they were unsuccessful, but they, they tried to from that point and, and were, had, you know, turned up the pressure ever since. It seems to be the, the strategy of the West to anytime there is any sort of leftist movement or leftist revolution, anything that actually threatens global, com or global capitalism, they will throw whatever resources they can at it to stop it. They will undermine elections. They will assassinate leaders. They will, you know, fund uh, right-wing death squads. They don't really care as long as capitalism stays in the driver's seat. <laughs> so there's that. But regardless, it, you know, it, it, it seemed like a pretty fair assessment to my mind, of, of the way things went down with the Bolsheviks and, and the Russian Revolution, the October Revolution. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I think he has some good insight at the very least, that things were not all as, as the USSR would have had you believe, um, but at the same time, not nearly as, as bad as the West believes. There's probably some truth somewhere in the middle there I don't mean to just be like, you know, well, one side says this, and the other side says that, so the truth must be somewhere in the middle, not, not that center sort of logic. Because it probably was much closer to the, the Bolshevik side of the story, but still, it seems as though the revolution could have been more complete, uh, could have given much more control to the people, and perhaps in the long run, the USSR would have lasted longer. Perhaps they'd still be around today. It's hard to say because there's a lot, there's all sorts of moving parts at play. And there's there's always the Western powers and their influence. There's things like famine, which, I mean, if you're super cynical, you you believe is within the, the USSR's control, but uh, probably easier to believe that incompetence was to blame rather than, than malice and I mean, <laughs> feelings of genocide. Um, so there's all sorts of factors that that went into that. I still I still think they they probably could have given more power to the people, and uh, that they should not have um, shied away from that idea. Not not gone so far from their own ideals. Of course, I'm just an armchair analyst from you know a hundred years after the fact. So basically, that's just my opinion. But that's how I that's how I see things at this point. Always open to new ideas or, or more information, though, too. So if you are watching this and you have other ideas of how things actually played out, um, 
always open to hear them. We are about education and having open minds here. But anyway, we're, we're moving on from that section of the book, and we're getting into uh, Berkman. Oops. What do I have shared here? I don't think that's the right one. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. Oh, no, it's not. Excuse me. I, I shared the wrong tab. Let's share the right tab. Um, so we're getting into Berkman's ideas. The, the, the chapters tonight are, is anarchism violence? And what is anarchism? Kind of seems like, you know, a, a book called What is Communist Anarchism may have started with a, a chapter like that rather than put it all the way in the, the you know, latter third of the book. But hey, you know, who am I to question his method? Here we go. Here's the, the one we're looking for. Turn on those subtitles. As always, we are using Audible Anarchist as our, our audiobook source. Um, here is the link to the first video of tonight. So this is chapter 19. I'll go ahead and put that in the chat for you. Just in case you don't have time to, to look at it tonight or you want to come back to it later, this will make it a little bit easier for you. So here's chapter 19. Whoops. There we go. 19. Put that right in the chat there. Okay. And as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. This is a this is a place of learning. So as long as you're coming in good faith and you're not just trying to waste everyone's time or derail things or talk about your own pet issue when, when that's not what we're really talking about tonight, as long as you're not doing those things, I always happen to, to help you out with whatever questions you may have. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm learning along with you, too. I'm, I by no means present myself as any kind of expert. I've just read a bit of theory. And uh, the idea is that we all help each other learn. Okay. Oh, oh, before I get started, too, wanted to just give one more plug. I have it up on the, the screen right now. To uh, If you are a, a leftist live streamer or video creator and you want to get a larger audience, you want to push yourself out to more areas, I am trying to, well, I am creating, we, we have created a live stream and video creator collective on Facebook. So if you just go to that address there, facebook.com slash left signal boost, and you find the pinned post, just leave a link to your content. And, uh, you know, assuming it's it's obviously enough leftists, then then we more than likely will, will pick you up and you'll be able to stream from that page as well. You may, in fact, be looking at that that stream right now. Uh, nope, doesn't look like. Oh, yeah, we do have one person watching from left signal boost TV right now. So we have four different creators that are all uh, streaming from that same page. In fact, there's a really cool event coming up, which I want to I'll also give a little plug to as well. Um, so one of our, our um, collective members, the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, has a really cool event coming up. It's a leftist discussion on left unity. Let me just get that event pulled up. And I'll give you the link for it so you can make sure not to miss that. Now, a lot of great content creators are going to be on it as well. I'll give you a little bit more information as soon as I find it again. Uh, where are we? Okay, here it is. So it's called uh, Leftist Unity and Should We Want It? And it's going to be on this Friday at 6 p.m. Central Time. I will post the link there right now. Why is it not letting me? Why is it not just giving me the link address? That sure is annoying. <laughs> well, maybe I won't then. Oh, well, you'll just have to go over to facebook.com slash left signal boost and look at, excuse me, our upcoming events. And that should be able to, to tell you. Yeah, so we have upcoming live videos, and the one scheduled for Friday is uh, what is leftist unity, or what is left unity, and should we want it? 
And oh, I was going to give you some more details about that too. Let's take a look. So it's going to be a big leftist roundtable led by Corey Johnson of the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. And it's going to have on it Justin Clark, Ben Burgess, Janice, Anarch, and some random geek. Um, the, 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 the few that, that I know of that panel are, are really good content creators, um, have some really good perspectives, and should have a lot of great things to say about it. Let's see if I can't share it one more time. Nope, it's not going to let me do it from there for some reason. But go check that out anyway. Thanks for the follow, uh, Spyrodox. How are you doing tonight? We are going to be talking about anarchism. All right, let's get into the audiobook. Uh, yeah, take it away, Alexander. Production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 19 Is Anarchism Violence? You have heard that anarchists oh, throw bombs, that they believe in violence, and that anarchy means disorder and chaos. It is not surprising that you should think so. The press, the pulpit, and everyone in authority constantly din it into your ears. But most of them know better, even if they have a reason for not telling you the truth. And that, that is certainly the case today. In fact, that's the, the main reason that, that anarchism, or anarchy, has become synonymous with just unorganized, violent chaos. That is by design. That is by people that do not want anyone to to take this position seriously. Um, so whether it's it's whether they know better and they're just doing it to you know uh, keep that sort of those sorts of thoughts down and uh, you know keep people feeling bad about them just as as a knee jerk reaction. Or, or whether they don't really care and they just like things as they are, so they're going to malign any sort of uh, philosophy that is not their own. It doesn't really matter. The, the point is, uh, it is on purpose that, that anarchism has become synonymous with the, the idea that there is no, no you know, it's, it's like, a, you know, a, a uh, middle schooler's idea of what, you know, what, what a great world would be. No rules, and, and we get to do just whatever we want, and no one can say what time we go to bed and all this stuff. It's absolutely nothing to do with the political philosophy of anarchism. Anarchism, from its very word, is, is, is an, which means no, and archism, which refers to hierarchy. So it is no hierarchy. That is the root of anarchism. The idea is to spread power as much as possible, and to challenge all systems, uh, all structures of power, unless they can prove themselves to be legitimate. So there, there are times, for sure, when there are legitimate hierarchies. If you work in a highly technical field, say you work in a nuclear power plant, you don't want just anyone making decisions about the safety of the plant. You need to have people that actually know what they're doing. So in that case, having expertise in in nuclear reactors and their safety makes sense for you to have control over those decisions. But in terms of other things in that same plant, like who gets compensated or, or you know, the various rates that people get compensated, compensated at, um, the scheduling, the workplace safety standards just in general, um, other sort of workplace policies, uh, benefits, that sort of thing, those everyone is capable of handling. There's no expertise needed to be able to make those sorts of decisions. And so we would say that any hierarchy imposed in that way, you know, the, the traditional capitalist way of doing things is very top down and autocratic. One person or a few people at the top make all the decisions in terms of hiring and firing, in terms of workplace policies, compensation, so on and so forth. That an anarchist would see as unjustified, unjustified hierarchy. So in that case, for those things, you want to have power spread out more evenly in, say, workplace democracy, such as a worker-owned cooperative. Um, 
So yeah, that is the, but, but I'll let Berkman explain his version of anarchy. He, I'm getting the impression throughout this book has a much more individual, individualistic, uh, definition of, of anarchy or anarchism. He seems to favor a much more individualist approach rather than uh, any sort of collectivist effort. For him, it seems to be more about the the freedom and power of the individual than it is about any sort of duty to one another more generally or about working together to, you know, liberate ourselves. But but I'll I'll let him continue on. It is time that you should hear it. I mean to speak to you honestly and frankly, and you can take my word for it, because it happens that I am just one of those anarchists who are pointed out as men of violence and destruction. I ought to know, and I have nothing to hide. Now, does anarchy really mean disorder and violence, you wonder? No, my friend. It is capitalism and the government which stands for disorder and violence. Anarchism is the very reverse of it. It means order without government and peace without violence. But is that possible, you ask? That is just what we're going to talk over now. But first, your friend demands to know whether the anarchists have never thrown bombs or have ever used any violence. And that's, the, you know, those are important concepts too. It's the idea of, you know, he puts it as um, peace or, or order without violence. I would say it's more eliminating as much coercion in the system as possible and as much unfair, unjustified hierarchies as possible. That would achieve a kind of peace, for sure. Uh, no longer could any one large employer hold the jobs over all their employees' heads and say, you have to submit to my demands, or else you're all fired. Um, uh, you know, no longer, or, or to a much less degree, for sure, there would be the, the charge of, of work or starve, which itself is a, a violent thing to say to people. But that is what is implicit, especially in our current, well, not especially, but including in our current system. It's also common to most economic systems, you know, feudalism, uh, a slave economy. All of these sorts of things have the, the implicit or explicit threat of work or starve. Now, of course, in, in an anarchist society, people still will need to work. There still will need to be labor accomplished, uh, but not necessarily by everybody. We already produce much more than we need in, in pretty much any sort of necessity of life that you could think of. We have more housing. We have more food. We have more health care potential. We have more educational potential or capacity. Uh, we have, we could produce a lot more, uh, transportation for everybody. All these sorts of necessities of life we have in abundance right now, or could build together if we so cho chose to do so. With all of that, there's just going to be inherently less violence because it means less people would resort to lives of crime. Most people don't want to get into lives of crime. Why would you? It's, it's. I mean, just from a very practical standpoint, it's a very dangerous way to live. You're always having to look over your shoulder. You always have to worry about people that you work with uh, turning on you. You have to worry about being caught by the police um, or the FBI. Uh, you have to worry about rival crime syndicates. It is a very difficult lifestyle. And for your average, say, like like taking drug dealing as an example. Your average drug dealer doesn't make above the the median income. You know, it, it's glorified quite often in media how much a, a drug dealer makes. But when it comes down to it, your average drug dealer or or part of a person who is part of a drug organization makes, you don't know, I, I think it was something like fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year last time I checked. I mean, I make that now just doing deliveries, but my sort of job is not available to everybody. Not everyone has even a driver's license. 
Um, so for places that, that lack a lot of opportunity and also lack a lot of security too, uh, where there's really no nothing to catch you if you do fall, that can be an attractive alternative. If instead we had those safety nets, if, if no matter what you did in your life, you could never worry about being homeless, never worry about starving, never worry about having to choose between food and medicine, all of these sorts of things. And if all the sorts of educational opportunities were open to you, uh, so you could rise as high as you're, you're able to in whatever field you care about, that empowers the average person. So all the people now that are, are struggling just to make it would no longer be struggling. All the people now who don't know where the next meal is coming from, that, that uh, you know, have debts piling up, that have uh, food in, in our housing insecurity. They can't afford to live in a place that is more, you know, a, a community that's more um, secure. If we were helping everyone to meet those basic needs, which most forms of anarchy, or anarchism, I should say, or communism, or socialism, uh, whatever leftist philosophy you may believe in, there's pretty much always that as a component of it, is providing people basic needs. Now, depending on where you're falling in that, it may be coming from the state, it may be coming from just or informal systems of mutual aid, but the result is the same. And the result is a more peaceful world, really. So that's what that was one of the things that, that Berkman was making a point for, and I think it's a very good point to make. So now let's get back into it. Uh, so he's talking about, you know, do the anarchists throw bombs? Have they ever used violence? And the answer is yes. Yes, anarchists have thrown bombs and have sometimes res resorted to violence. There you are, your friend exclaims. I thought so. But do not let us be hasty. If anarchists have sometimes employed violence, does it necessarily mean that anarchism means violence? Ask yourself this question and try to answer it honestly. When a ci citizen puts on a soldier's uniform, he may have to throw bombs and use violence. Will you say then that citizenship stands for bombs and violence? True enough. You will indignantly resent the imputation. It simply means you will reply that under certain, certain circumstances, a man may have to resort to violence. The man may happen to be a Democrat, a monarchist, a socialist, a Bolshevist, or an anarchist. You will find that this applies to all men at all times. Brutus killed Caesar because he feared his friend meant to betray the Republic and become king. Not that Brutus loved Caesar less, but that he loved Rome more. Brutus was not an anarchist. He was a loyal Republican. William Tell, as folklore tells us, shot to death the tyrant in order to rid his country of oppression. Tell never had heard of anarchism. I mention these instances to illustrate the fact that from time immemorial, despots met their fate at the hands of outraged lovers of liberty. Such men were rebels against tyranny. They were generally patriots, Democrats or Republicans, occasionally socialists or anarchists. Their acts were cases of individual rebellion against wrong and injustice. Anarchism had nothing to do with it. There was a time in ancient Greece when killing a despot was considered the highest virtue. Modern law condemns such acts, but human feeling seems to have remained the same in this matter as in the old days. The conscience of the world does not feel outright, outraged by tyrannicide. Even if publicly not approved, the heart of mankind condones and often even secretly rejoices in such, such acts. Were there not thousands of patriotic youths in America willing to assassinate the German Kaiser, whom they held responsible for starting the world war? Did not a French court recently acquit a man who killed Petlura to avenge the thousands of men, women, and children murdered in the Petlura pogroms against the Jews of South Russia? In every land, in all ages, there have been tyrannicides, that is, men and women who love their country well enough to sacrifice even their own lives for it. Usually, 
they were persons of no political party or idea, but simply haters of tyranny. Occasionally they were religious fanatics, like the devout Catholic Coleman, who tried to assassinate Bismarck, or the misguided enthusiast Charlotte Corday, who killed Marat during the French Revolution. In the United States, three presidents were killed by such individual acts. Lincoln was shot in 1865 by John Wilkes Booth, who was a Southern Democrat. Garfield in 1881 by Charles Jules Gutio, a Republican, and McKinley in 1901 by Leon Solzhenitsyn. Out of the three, only one was an anarchist. The country that has the worst oppressors also produces the greatest number of tyrannicides, which is natural. Take Russia, for, for instance. With complete suppression of speech and press under the czars, there was no way of mitigating the despotic regime other than by putting the fear of God into the tyrant's heart. Those avengers were mostly sons and daughters of the highest nobility, idealistic youths who loved liberty and the people. With all other avenues closed, they felt themselves compelled to resort to the pistol and dynamite in the hopes of alleviating the miserable conditions of their country. They were known as nihilists and terror terrorists. They were not anarchists. So that, that should make sense just on a pretty intuitive level, I think. The more absolute control a particular system of government has over its people, uh, the more the only way to actually make change is to kill the person at the top or the people at the top. Uh, if there's no other avenue, what really else is there? And you may be able to suppress it for generations, for hundreds of years, but eventually the, the, you know, there's going to be enough people that have had enough and they will lead a revolt. And actually revolts happen quite often under feudalism uh, and I mean the same thing is true of a, a slave economy if you and all your family are enslaved and you, you you know if it's under say chattel slavery and there's no chance of you ever getting out by by any sort of legal means really it's just takes being pushed far enough to you know have have a, a result a, a revolt uh, take place. Have people rise up against you because that's literally their only option. I mean, I suppose they could escape as well. And that did happen too. But uh, there were plenty of slave revolts. There was a lot of them. I mean, Haiti, Haiti the, the country of Haiti was founded on a slave revolt. Um, so... Uh, it would stand to reason then that the, the more power is shared, the more it is spread out evenly. For one thing, the less reason there is to revolt because you yourself already have more power. And, and one would think that if it is uh, spread out enough, at least within that particular territory, there would be virtually zero reason to revolt uh, because everyone would have other means of getting what they need and what they want. Just, just some food for thought, I would say. In modern times, individual acts of political violence have been even more frequent than in the past. The women suffer, suffragettes in England, for example, suffragettes. frequently resort to it to propagate and carry out their demands for equal rights. In Germany, since the war, men of the most conservative political views have used such methods in the hope of reestablishing the kingdom. <laughs> it was a monarchist who killed Karl Erzberger, the Prussian Minister of Finance, and Walter Rathenau, Minister of Foreign Affairs, was also laid low by a man in the same political party. Why the original cause of, or at least the excuse for, the Great War itself was the killing of an Austrian heir to the throne by a Serbian patriot who had never heard of anarchism. In Germany, Hungary, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and in every other European country, Men of the most varied political views have resorted to acts of violence. Not to speak of the wholesale political terror practiced by fascists in Italy, the Ku Klux Klan in America, or the Catholic Church in Mexico. Very good points. And, and you could say that Berkman's doing a little bit of a whataboutism here, 
So the charge is, he's like, oh, so you say anarchists are violent? Well, look at all the violence in the system already. Look at the, the violence on the much larger scale. So that is a little, little bit of, yeah, but also you. But I think he has a point. These, these forms of violence are much more extensive, much more coordinated uh, than anarchism ever has been. So even if there are isolated, you know, what you might even consider terrorist attacks carried out by anarchists, it's really nothing. And, you know, in the modern day, uh, for all the, the squawking that the right likes to do about, you know, groups like Antifa uh, being just so violent towards so many people, the number one terror uh, category in the United States and, and has been for the past, I don't know how many decades, has been right-wing white supremacist violence. You know, that, that's, what they, that, that's what led to the Oklahoma City bombing. That's what led to um, you know, Anders Breivik. That's, that's not in the U.S., but it's a, another example of right-wing violence that is just completely indiscriminate and horrific. Anarchists don't do this. Like, like even when there are terror attacks, it's never on that same scale. And it's never targeted towards just any random innocent person, let alone children. Uh, many of the school shootings have been uh, white supremacist motivated. There was uh, uh, Dylan Roof said it pretty explicitly, motivated by right wing ideals. Uh, the, the same was was true of the Columbine kids. Time and time again, the right has, has always been shown to be much more violent because, well, for a variety of reasons, they don't actually care about most people. <laughs> they care about themselves and maintaining their own position and perhaps the positions of a few favored friends and relatives. But beyond that, they don't really care. They struggle very much with things like empathy, with even trying to understand where other people are coming from. And they, you know, you hear the, the term degenerate thrown out all the time, used unironically. And, you know, and on a personal note, I don't really like the use of the term degenerate, even ironically. I think it's, it's too easy a way to dehumanize uh, our opponents. And I don't think we need to resort to that sort of thing. And I don't think we need to propagate what seems to be a, a firmly right wing way of looking at things even if we're doing it ironically, because the right wing does it ironically too. You know, they, they have all this shit posting and their memes and all oh, it's just jokes and, and and all these sorts of things that they use to creep further and further to more and more extreme positions until it's you can't really tell if it's a joke anymore. You can't really tell if people actually believe the things they want to believe, and that's part of the point. You can advance a lot of stuff under the guise of humor under the guise of irony, under the guise of, of not taking things seriously. So in that particular case, I think it's important for the left not to mimic that at all. Um, but that's just my little aside. Yeah, you know, Bergman's talking about all this institutional violence that takes place under capitalism. I mean... The, the institution of chattel slavery happened in what was a, a self-avowed capitalist country. Now, of course, slavery is a slave economy, but it was tolerated by a capitalist country, a supposedly capitalist country, a country that had gotten beyond monarchy, finally, gotten beyond the rule of the, the English, finally. And yet somehow they were still allowing even less freedom, or even less free systems of economy to, to take place. And that's tremendous violence that capitalism has to be somewhat responsible for. Because even if you separate the, the, you know, separate it into the North and South, having each their own dominant form of economy, the South having a slave economy, the North having a mostly capitalist economy, those capitalist uh, businesses in the North we're still wholly reliant on the products from slavery. As capitalism very much is, is still, a lot of the time, 
reliant on slave or nearly slave labor uh, from within our country in, in terms of prison labor and, you know, off the books dealing with, with migrant farmers um, to exploiting looser regulated labor markets around the world. It's funny how capitalism can't ever seem to just be reliant on its itself alone. It always has to rely on some greater form of explo exploitation, even if it's not within its own borders. Um, there's there's likely much less exploitation that that happens on you know on a on the scale of like sweatshops and 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 slave labor. I don't think much of that happens in say Scandinavian countries, but they still rely on on raw materials and products from countries that are looser. So they still benefit somewhat from really horrific practices. Okay, enough of that. Let, let's let's move on in the chapter. We're almost halfway done with this already, with this chapter. We'll do a couple chapters tonight. You see then that anarchists have no monopoly on political violence. The number of such acts by anarchists is infinitesimal as compared to those committed by persons of other political persuasions. The truth is in that every country, in every social movement, violence has been a part of the struggle from time immemorial. Even the Nazarene, who came out to preach the gospel of peace, resorted to violence Jesus, in to case you weren't familiar with out of the temple. As I have said, anarchists have no monopoly on violence. On the contrary, the teachings of anarchism are those of peace and harmony, of non-invasion, of the sacredness of life and liberty. But anarchists are human. Like, See, that's the thing. The left is oriented towards more people. It is oriented towards the, the liberation and upliftment of more people. That is one of the main things that divides left and right. It's, do you care about exploitation of your fellow man, or are you okay with that as long as you're the beneficiary of that arrangement? Um, so, I mean, if you're okay with, you know, hurting and, and destroying anyone that, that stands in the way of your political beliefs, you probably don't really care about people's liberation in general. Um, like the rest of mankind, and perhaps more so, they're more sensitive to wrong and injustice, quicker to resent oppression, and therefore not exempt from occasionally voicing their protest by an act of violence. Mm -hmm. But such acts are an expression of individual temperament and not of any political theory. Uh, it's not necessarily true either. There have been violent acts that have led to, you know, workplace progress. It, it, it was violence that led to the eight-hour workday. It was violence that led to a lot of... Uh, workplace safety reformations. Um, in, in large part, it was, it was you, know, you can't ignore the violence that helped usher in the civil rights era, that, that helped get women the right to vote. Uh, you can't talk about LGBTQIA issues without mentioning the Stonewall Riot. That whole movement started when enough people had had enough and were violent towards the police who were so brutally repressing them, killing them on a, on a daily basis. <laughs> it's not something that especially liberals in, in the United States like to, to face, but it is a fact that pretty much any progress that has been made somewhere along the way, it has required some amount of violence. And that's because the powers that be want to remain the powers that be. They don't want to share power. They don't want more people to be included. They like things as they are because it does well for them personally. So they, they I mean, they justify that, you know, this, this has to be the way things are. This is inevitable. You know, I wish there was a better way, but this is the only way that, you know, the economy can work. And if we did things a different way, we'd be overrun by, you know, people that were more ruthless and so on and so forth. But when it comes down to it, they're happy keeping the system as it is. 
so at some point there there there, there comes there's the, it's, it's as he was talking about earlier there there comes a point where there's nothing more you can do now this is no, by no means a call to violence I'm not saying that at all i think there are ways that we can organize and and gain power amongst one another without ever being the aggressors in any sort of conflict but that's not to say that conflict wouldn't come for us even if we're talking about a a prefigurative system one where we are using the the relative safety and, and stability of a capitalist first world nation such as the US where you don't have to worry about warlords sweeping in and and toppling anything that you build you don't have to worry about other revolutions taking place right wing revolutions really those will be put down as well um there is some semblance of, of rule of law even if that is incredibly flawed and biased there is still some if we were to use that system as as a bulwark where we educate and organize ourselves and build systems of mutual aid to provide for one another what the government has failed in providing for us those being the you know first and foremost the necessities of life as i spoke of earlier uh we can do that without enacting violence but that's not to say that there will never be powers that feel threatened by that because at some point there would be i was just reading about in the, in this book that i will be covering much later on probably after we get through a bunch of stuff including das kapital uh so a ways away i mean i think das kapital if we're doing the first even if we're just doing the first two volumes probably is going to end up taking an entire year uh, so i may have to add another day of theory just to to work in other stuff at that time i don't really know but anyway i do plan on covering this book anyway at, at some point it's it's the politics of um social democracy and and the subtitle is uh libertarian munis uh, municipalism yeah i believe that's the subtitle uh janet beal is is the author and she was talking about in the book how even if, even though we're setting up these systems with the idea of being peaceful at some point they will come to rival you know if we're successful in what we do they will come to rival the institutionalized and legitimized powers that be and at that point there may be a conflict there may be a, a crisis of who is really in control and so at that point violence may come to us so that always has to be something that anyone who really wants change has to reconcile with that even if you're not instituting it even if you're not instigating look what happens with like the the black lives matter protests how often they are provoked into violence through the actions of police and the police know this too they want an excuse to crack heads and you know violently restore order and so they'll do things like push crowds they'll they'll do shows of force they'll kettle them into areas where they panic they will use flashbang grenades on people that are not doing anything they'll shoot rubber bullets at people that aren't doing anything um and i you know that 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 video that uh, of the last uh of the george floyd protests uh, i think it was in buffalo or albany or somewhere where you know you see all these these you know fully riot geared out police walking towards an old man who is just wanting to talk with them and they violently push him down his his head hits the ground blood starts coming out he he lived but it's just they don't need <laughs> they don't really need much of an excuse this is their way of of reconciling you know of, of understanding the world and and dealing with threats they see so at any point if you're doing enough if you're making enough change you're going to be perceived as a threat by somebody so at that point you may have to un to make a decision about how worth it it is to you to keep pushing for what you're pushing for anyway let's move on 
You might ask whether the holding of revolutionary ideas would not naturally influence a person towards deeds of violence. I do not think so, because we have seen that violent methods are also employed by people of the most conservative opinions. If persons of directly opposite political views commit similar acts, it is hardly reasonable to say that their ideas are responsible for such acts. Like results have a like cause, but that cause is not to be found in political convictions, rather in individual temperament and the general feeling about violence. You might be right about temperament, you say. I can see that revolutionary ideas are not the cause of political acts of violence, else every revolutionist would be committing such acts. But do not such views to some extent justify those who commit such acts? It may seem so at first sight, but if you think it over, you will find that it is an entirely wrong idea. The best proof of it is that anarchists who hold exactly the same views about government and the necessity of abolishing it often disagree entirely on the question of violence. Thus, Tolstoyan anarchists and most individual anarchists condemn political violence while other anarchists approve or at least justify it. Is it reasonable then to say that anarchist views are responsible for violence or in any way influence such acts? Moreover, many anarchists who at one time believed in violence as a means of propaganda have changed their opinion about it and do not favor such methods anymore. There was a time, for instance, when anarchists advocated individual acts of violence known as propaganda by deed. They did not expect to change government and capitalism into anarchism by such acts, nor did they think that the taking off of a despot would abolish despotism. No, terrorism was considered a means of avenging a popular wrong, inspiring fear in the enemy, and also calling attention to the evil against which the act of terror was directed. But most anarchists today do not believe any more in the propaganda of the deed. Yeah, and I would not either. As I said, if you're if you're trying hard enough, if you're pushing hard enough for change, one way or another, the violence will find you. So I, I see no reason to add to that by by going out of your way to commit violence. Uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, that, that's all I want to say about that. And do not favor acts of that nature. Experience has taught them that though such methods may have been justified and useful in the past, modern conditions of life make them unnecessary and even harmful to the spread of their ideas. But their ideas remain the same, which means that it was not anarchism which shaped their attitude to violence. It proves that it is not certain ideas or isms that lead to violence, but that some other causes bring it about. We must therefore look elsewhere to find the right explanation. As we have seen, acts of political violence have been committed not only by anarchists, socialists, and revolutions of all kinds, but also by patriots, nationalists, by democrats and republicans, by suffragettes, by conservatives, and reactionaries, by monarchists and royalists, and even by religionists and devout Christians. We <laughs> A little bit of a sidetrack here, but I did want to point out, too, that it's important when we talk about violence to make sure we frame it properly. Uh, destroying buildings is not ideal. Uh, destroy, you know, Stealing property is not ideal. But I don't think you consider any of those acts of violence. Uh, unless doing so directly harms the people inside or the people who own the property. That is a different thing. So we should be careful about that because anyone who's looking for a reason to condemn a particular protest, a particular uh, movement is, is going to try to equate these sorts of things. They'll try to focus on all the property damage. They'll try to focus on all of the business owners who lost their entire livelihood and, and so on and so forth. And that is to deflect attention away from the reasons that people are upset in the first place. The initial violent acts, almost always, that are the reason for people to be out there and protesting in the first place. 
property doesn't have feelings. Right. Property doesn't have feelings. People do. Property doesn't die. People do. So we should seek. And people have insurance too. So there's that as well. Right. I'll be joining. Buildings can be rebuilt. Businesses can can be reconstituted. People cannot be brought back from the dead. People cannot be unmaimed or unbeaten. So always keep things in perspective when, when we're talking about that, especially with people that are detractors and, and trying to bring things down. Because if you're someone who likes the status quo, you're going to use any excuse you can to condemn any rumblings of change. Uh, you'll you'll object to the manner in which it's it's uh, demanded. You know they say, oh, you, you it's okay to, to to protest, but you shouldn't be out in the streets because you're blocking traffic. <laughs> Even though it's been shown many times that during BLM protests, uh, during pretty much every left wing protest that there is. If there are emergency vehicles, they will either avoid the area or the crowd, crowds will part for them. Okay. The same cannot be said of the current uh, Canadian trucker convoy protest who just plant themselves and honk for hours on end and then go sit in their inflatable hot tubs and, you know, just have a party while they... I mean, there's there's much more of an argument to be made that those people are doing real violence to people. They're, they're certainly harassing everybody around them. And forget about emergency vehicles getting through entire streets that are blocked off by truckers. That's just not happening. Although you don't hear the same people who condemn BLM, who condemn anytime Antifa has a demonstration. You don't hear those same people saying that stuff about the truckers. And there's some reason they, they support the truckers. It's kind of weird, huh? Because that's not ever really the point. The point is to divert attention. So that, that, that's my overall point, though, is make sure that we define and frame well what real violence is and what is just property damage. And keep people at the heart of what we're doing. Don't let them change the subject. Don't let them divert attention away to things. Things are replaceable. People are not. We know that it could not have been any particular idea or ism that influenced their acts, because the most varied ideas and isms produced similar deeds. I have given as the reason individual temperament and the general feeling about violence. Here is the crux of the matter. What is the general feeling about violence? If we can answer this question correctly, the whole matter will be clear to us. If we speak honestly, we must admit that everyone believes in violence and practice it however he may condemn it in others. In fact, all of the institutions we support and the entire life of present day society are based on violence. Right. And if, if we're including in violence, coercion, the, the, the force to do or to not to do something, then the entire system is a violent system. The entire system inflicts violence on people on a daily basis because they coerce people to work or starve. I mean, that right there, that, that's, pretty, that's a pretty violent thing to say to somebody. It's a pretty violent attitude to have towards humanity that you don't deserve to live. You need to work or starve. And right away, that, that means that anyone who cannot work uh, either has to just die. So, so anyone who's too... Uh, has a disability, anyone who is of retirement age, anyone who, for whatever reason, cannot work, should either starve or potentially just be at the mercy, have their entire life be at the mercy of charitable donations, you know. But that still says to them, you don't really deserve this. But in spite of you not deserving this, because I'm such a great person, I'm going to give you the means to live still. 
that right there, I mean, you could you could definitely argue that that right there does violence to a person's psyche at the very least to say that you're not worthy of this life that I'm I'm helping you still live. Uh, yeah, it's it's just as he says, president society is based on violence. And an anarchist society would have still a coercive component to it. We would be coercing people to not engage in capitalism anymore. We would be coercing people to not engage in slavery or feudalism or indentured servitude or any other sort of exploitative system. We would be curtailing the freedoms and rights of, of people in an absolute sense for the benefit of the rights of the many, for everyone to have a higher degree of freedom, um, for everyone to have the ability to live free, free of, of, of as much coercion as possible. But that does mean that people who would just love to go back to an old system or a more coercive system or, you know, love to have more absolute freedom at the expense of everyone's relative relative freedom uh, they would be suppressed from doing so 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 when it comes down to it, it it has to be what is the the greater transgression preventing a few people from exercising absolute freedom to do whatever the hell they want even if it means curtailing the freedom of other people in the process? Or do we want to maximize freedom for as much people as possible? What do we want to have our society based on? In both cases, in order to maintain it, it will demand a degree of coercion because there's always going to be dissenters. There's always going to be people that don't want to play by the rules. There'll always be psychopaths who don't really care who they hurt. Uh, who they step on, who just want to accumulate power. But there, in that, uh, is a clear argument. If you're one of, you know, if you ever come up against uh, these conservatives who like to use the human nature argument, oh, humans are just greedy. They're, you know, they're selfish. They, they, they only out for themselves. You know, that's just the way the world works. Okay, let's pretend you're you're right on that. Would you rather have a system that rewards that sort of behavior by being, you know, giving the, the best positions in society, the ones willing to be as ruthless and as cold hearted and as backstabbing and, and uh, conniving as possible? Or should we instead set up society so that those people are prevented from reaching so much power? that they can actually do damage to others with it? Should we spread power out enough that, that not only is there not that lure because there, there are no huge concentrations of power anymore, but also there's less ability, there's less absolute power for people to do stuff with. So which system would you rather have? Even if you believe that people are inherently bad, why not still have a system that doesn't reward that as much as possible? Why not have a system that works for the liberation of as many people as possible, no matter what people individually feel or individually willing to do to achieve power? What is the thing we call government? Is it anything else but organized violence? The law orders you to do this I mean, it is. or not to do that. And if you fail to obey, it will compel you by force. We are not discussing just now whether or not it is right or wrong, whether it should or should not be so. Just now, we are interested in the fact that it is so, that all government, all law and authority rest on force and violence, on punishment or the fear of punishment. Even spiritual authority, the authority of the church and God rests on force and violence. 
because it is the fear of the divine wrath and vengeance that wields power over you, compels you to obey, and even to believe against your own reason. Wherever you turn, you will find that our entire life is built on violence or the fear of it. From earliest childhood, you are subjected to the violence of your parents or elders. At home, in school, in the office, factory, field, or shop, it is always someone's authority which keeps you obedient and compels you to do his will. The right to compel you is called authority. Fear of punishment has been made into duty and is called obedience. In this atmosphere of force and violence, of authority and obedience, of duty, fear and punishment, we all grow up. We breathe it throughout our lives. We are so steeped in the spirit of violence, we never ask whether violence is right or wrong. We only la ask whether it is legal, whether the law permits it. You don't question the right of the government to kill, to confiscate and imprison. If a private person should be guilty of the things the government is doing all the time, you'd brand him a murderer, a thief, and a scoundrel. But as long as the violence committed is lawful, you approve of it and submit to it. So it is not really violence that you object to, but to people using violence unlawfully. This lawful violence and fear of it dominate our whole existence, individual and collective. Authority controls our lives from the cradle to the grave. Authority parental, priestly and divine, political, economic, social and moral. But whatever the character of that authority, it is always the same executioner wielding power over you through your fear of punishment in one form or another. You are afraid of God and the devil, of the priest and your neighbor, of your employer and your boss, of the politician and the policeman, and remember, remember, too, that even under anarchism, there is still authority. It's just that it is shared amongst all people. Everyone. It, just as moving to socialism is the destruction of the worker-owner relationship, the, the destruction of the exploiter-exploited relationship, uh, moving to anarchism, too, is the destruction of the division between people and the government. It's getting as many people as possible to be the government so that that authority is shared as in, in as many hands as possible so that no one person can lord it over everyone else. And this is the ideal goal of, of communism as well. Oh, do you need me to move? What's, what do you ask? Okay, I don't know that I can move over. All right, I'll try. Okay, come on. I'll try. <clears throat> That better? You know, you could you could move first and then pull the chair up to you, or you could just give me the stink eye. I suppose that's a possibility too. Everybody's looking forward to it, so. Oh, they love your looks. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Yeah. All right, so please welcome to the show my wife Amanda. She's gonna be joining me. Let's adjust the camera here so that you're in frame. Hey, everybody, let's talk about getting rid of the capitalist system. I, I should have you record my new intro. <laughs> I mean, we could auto-tune the crap out of that. Oh, okay. Well, as long as you do that. Auto-tune, I'm going to sound like a robot. So we, we, are, we are talking about the violence inherent in the system and the authority that is also inherent in the system and how all these these critiques of anarchism as violence and bomb throwing and stuff like that very much pale in comparison to the actual violence done just by having capitalism. Having a system that's structured against the people that it depends on. Absolutely. It's good also, like, to me, the violence comes after not being heard. I think most people generally start out calm. Most people. Hold on, I, I'm gonna open the window. And keep, keep going on with that thought, but it's getting way too hot in this room. It's getting hot in here. Okay, I don't, I don't have to turn it into. A... Sorry, guys. I forgot. It's a no fun Wednesday. <laughs> you got it. 
the rollover from work because work wasn't enough. So now we got to do it at home too. Oh my God. Hashtag this sucks. Oh my God. Hashtag I should probably start going to church on Wednesdays. Just kidding. No, but I think violence violence is the route of the unheard. And again, if it's violence against property, like really, truly, who are you actually hurting? Like physical harm is greater than and, and damage to buildings. Damage to buildings. Damage to things. Even and I things. also think about like the mindset of people now, right? And myself included. Like I'm very dependent on this system that's dependent upon me. And I have to submit to the system to get a paycheck and to get uh, insurance and other things that I really cannot handle going without because I, I need it. Absolutely. But I know I have to play the game. Well, just think about that too. Think of all the, the literal violence that this system does to people by not providing us health care. Mm -hmm. There's people that have to choose between insulin and food. There's people that have to to go without meds mm -hmm. and risk their entire life. I How could you not define that as violence? Right. And it's not only just like the physicalities, right? Like you're not treating your illnesses, but I think over time it also starts to impact your mental health, which is another area that makes me upsetty spaghetti about this system. Like mental health is not valued at all. Like just True. because you can't see it, doesn't mean it's not there. Thank you, Tom York. And I know that's not exactly verbatim how that quote goes, but I like. I just want to see real quick how many chapters we have. But continue your thought. I mean, Tom York is my hero. I... There's a lot to be said for the way that we treat people. Yeah, and absolutely. Like, oh, to be the top, you know, to be the boss is like to be the master. I mean, really now I see is to be the master exploiter, but it was funny growing up how my parents kind of taught me like the only, and this is really terrible, the only way you get to be the boss is to be dumber than everybody else. Well, <laughs> like the least competent, but then at the same time, it does take a certain skill to be able to manipulate others. That's true. But, but even that, even the idea that, oh, well, why don't you, if you're tired of being exploited, why not just, you know, start your own company, become your own boss. And, and that kind of glosses over the fact that you then have to just exploit other people. So it's not actually changing any part of the system. It's, Right, you're just, just putting take... yourself at the other end of it. But then also, like, it's not so simple. Like, everybody goes, oh, why don't you start your own business? Well, it's not it's so not easy. You, I mean, you can't you just gotta... walk into a bank and say, look at this picture I drew. I want to start a business selling hot dogs. And, like, they're going to laugh you out of the office. Like, How's that go? I'm not going to perform it again for you. You just have to wait. Anyway, okay. the point being... uh for one thing, not everyone is just good at business or has any desire to be their own uh, entrepreneur. And for another thing, yeah, it's not that simple. You have mm -hmm. to have good credit. You have to have some sort of collateral usually, or you have to have some sort of capital formation process where you get in touch with the, the right angel investors who are, who are willing, you know, a bunch of rich ass guys who are just willing to make a lot of little bets on a lot of little companies because mm -hmm. they know that that's you know overall enough of them will hit that they'll get their money back so term okay. angel and angel investors a, a bit of a misnomer a bit of a a you know stroking your own ego sort of a, a title because yeah, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart they're doing it because they can afford to make a lot of little bets and have 80% of them fail Very and then still exploiter. overall make a, a profit. I mean, me personally, I have zero desire to be the boss, to be the top. I would like to start one. a business, but I want it to be a, a worker-owned cooperative. Like, 
I just want to be. And, that, wanna... and that's fine too, but and that's I'm it. sure you would also like to have, say, a democratic say in the scheduling at your work, mm -hmm. in the pay rates at your work. Oh, of course, because in that's the benefits at your work. Yeah, because that's a helpful system because it benefits the collective good of the group. But it also would benefit you. Like, think about like waitressing and stuff like that. Like the best shifts are Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. Right. Because mm -hmm. or maybe not Sunday, but like Friday, Saturday night. That's that's the top spot. And like, let's say you work in the service industry, excuse me, industry. Thank you. And you're not the best at it. Odds are you're not going to get those shifts. So your take home isn't going to be as great because. Well, and a lot of it's based on seniority, too, which is basically just a system of I've been here longer. So screw you. Mm -hmm. It's not I'm better at this. It's it's not all these these sorts of things that it's, I've done capitalists my time. throw up as defenses of capitalism. It's it's just I have physically been here longest, so I get the pick. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. It's rude. <laughs> it's rude. <laughs> anyway, I mean. In some cases, I guess I kind of, it's hard for me. Okay. I've said this a thousand times. I work in education. So sometimes I understand, like, if someone works really hard and they've put in a lot of time, you know, I, it's icky. Just gag me. I'm done. Continue. But see, the thing is, if you had a democratic say and you did want to reward those sorts of things, you can get together with the rest of the employees and say, so-and-so has been really working her ass off, you know, puts in the, the time every day, does really good. Mm -hmm. Why don't we vote to raise their pay? And yeah. then you could do that. Or maybe Cheryl's really close to retirement, but she's tenure. Maybe we let Cheryl be done early. Hey, yeah, look, let's let someone let's else climb up. Let's package and... and Let's give her a benefits package and let her bounce. Like, let her go. Let her go on with her life. Like, sure. But these are things that you could at least have a say over. That, that, that's, the, that's the main difference when we're getting to into socialism, where people directly have the means of, of production under their control, is they get to make those decisions collectively. And they get to... So whether we're talking about market socialism, whether we're talking about anarchism, whether we're talking about uh, a form of communism where the workers have control over their own factories and, and, and places of business. Um, it's all basically the same. You have a democratic say in the workings, major workings of your company. Now, again, there's still room for expertise. I, I brought up the, the example earlier of if you work in a nuclear power plant, you don't want the janitor to have an equal say on, on how to handle the reactor. You want to have an expert in, in the way that reactors work. So then maybe all of the people that handle the reactors. Right. But all the people have that have that, that discussion. Sure, 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 sure. But what I'm saying is there are certain areas where expertise, of course, is justified. That would be a justified hierarchy. But that doesn't necessarily translate to it being um, a justified hierarchy when it comes to. Please don't touch the mic. Sorry. If there's a hair on there. It doesn't mean that that janitor can't have or shouldn't have an equal say in how they are compensated or how anyone there is compensated. In those sorts of, of questions, there is no justified hierarchy. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right. Let's move on. Of the judge and the jailer, of the law and government, all your life is a long chain of fears, fears which bruise your body and lacerate your soul. On those fears is based the authority of God, of the church, of parents, of the capitalist and ruler. Look into your heart and see if what I say is not true. Why, even among children, the ten-year-old Johnny bosses his younger brother or sister by the authority of his greater physical strength just as Johnny's father bosses him by his superior strength and by Johnny's dependence upon his support. You stand for the authority of priest and preacher 
because you think they can call down the wrath of God upon your head. You submit to the domination of your boss, judge, and You're government just not going to church because of the to power to, to deprive you of your work, to ruin your business, to put you in prison. A power, by the way, that you yourself have given into their hands. So authority rules your whole life. The authority of the past and the present, of the dead and the living, and your existence is a continuous invasion and violation of yourself, a constant subjugation to the thoughts and the will of someone else. And as you are invaded and violated, you subconsciously revenge yourself by invading and violating others over whom you have authority or can exercise compulsion, physical or moral. In this way, all life has become a crazy quilt of authority, of domination and submission, of command and obedience, of coercion and subjection, of rulers and ruled, of violence and force in a thousand and one forms. Can you wonder that even idealists are still held in the meshes of this spirit, of authority and violence, and are often impelled by their feelings and environment to invasive acts entirely at variance with their ideas? We are all still barbarians who resort to force and violence to settle our doubts, difficulties, and troubles. Violence is the method of ignorance, the weapon of the weak. The strong of heart and brain need no violence, for they are irresistible in their consciousness of being right. I disagree with that. Okay. Violence is the last resort. Sure. But sometimes necessary. Mm-hmm. No matter what system you have, there will be some that, that don't want to get along with it. There'll be some that want to dominate and, and keep down others for their own gain. Mm -hmm. Some that just want to arbitrarily hurt people. It's, it's, that's an unfortunate fact. And those, again, those few that actually just really, really want to hurt people are so far on the outside. Absolutely. I'm not like, saying it would be commonplace. Right. Uh, just that it would be, you know. You know, maybe some folks from Still Florida and Wisconsin. Flo Why Florida and Wisconsin are you, are you picking okay. them in general or in particular? Wisconsin has in a Florida, very substantial. Ed Gein? That was one dude. There's more. There's like a whole. Let me, let me pull up. No, 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 no. We're not going down that rabbit hole. Come on. We're not, we're not going to join I just the, the ranks of the, the serial killer podcasts out there. I mean, That's they're not, not wrong. Right. But yeah, there's going to be psychopaths in any population. There's going to be people willing to do tremendous violence for their own personal pleasure or gain or whatever. And you do have to be able to deal with those people. It's just a question of whether you delegate that all to the people at the top and just hope that the people at the top aren't those same people. Um, or you spread it out amongst as many people as possible so that everyone can, you know, weigh their conscience and, and decide together what, if anything, should be done. Jeffrey Dahmer, Walter Ellis. Okay, okay. Well, we're not going to do that. David Spanbar, again. Please. We don't need a list of Wisconsin serial killers. We really don't, though. I'm just saying. There, there, are, there have been Minnesota serial killers as well. If they're not. Yeah, they're not. They're not but, all relegated to to Wisconsin and, and no, Florida. No, but there's. I mean, John Wayne Gacy was from Illinois. Um, the the Golden State State Killer was in in California. There's there there are psychopaths everywhere. Just just not in very high amounts of any population, thankfully. Hmm. But this is all. That's all a wild tangent. That's not. We're not talking about. It that specifically except for how it relates to coercive force coercive force is violence uh, i think that's a pretty safe thing to to contend um even though hand caps often don't believe that they believe as long as you have the choice to go work for someone else you're not being coerced <sighs> and, and no violence is being committed against you Except that entire process of finding another job is practically a full-time job within itself. itself yeah. Excuse me. I can assure you, right. I've lost my job before. I put, let's see, 400 job applications in. I maybe had five interviews and maybe got two offers. 
out of the entire thing. It is a really horrendous statistics game. I would not recommend. Yeah, it's very difficult. And in Ancapistan, there would be absolutely no social safety net. They, they would not even require things like uh, unemployment insurance mm -hmm. or anything like that. So you'd literally just be out on your own. So yep. you better hope that you have some family member that you can lean on. Otherwise, you're pretty much stuck to your job, which mm -hmm. if that's not coercion, if that's not violence, you I don't, don't, know I don't really is. know what is. Because, I mean, yeah. But ANCAPs are, are very infantile in their thinking as well. They, they can only conceive of freedom in absolute terms. How much freedom do I have to do what I want to do? If anyone is preventing any of my freedom, that's a bad system. doesn't matter how my freedom affects other people. That's their problem, not mine. That's basically the end cap mentality. I want a golden goose and I want it now. Yeah, that's right. I can get it for you later, sweetie. Now, I want it now. Right. Um, so, yeah. And it's funny, too. Like, I mean, as someone still in the job force, like the desperation to cover certain positions mm -hmm. is like, we'll just. We'll just hire whoever walks through the door. Like, great. So great. Okay. I don't, I don't know how that fits into our conversation. All right, never mind. Maybe I should just walk out. No, 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 I'm no. I'm just, I'm just trying to problem. understand. I did not, I'm not saying you're becoming Sorry. a problem. Stop. Reset. Let, let's continue the, the, the chapter. Mm. Yeah, why are you ahead of me? The further we get away from primitive man and that hatchet age, the less recourse. Mm, that part I don't like. The idea that somehow primitive people were just inherently violent and, and barbarous to one another, and that only civilized people can be civilized. That's that's ridiculous. Also, different cultures are different. Are different. And different not only uh, across geography, but across time. You know, there was there was a time where the US was a a a you know, a, a basically a quilt of different tribes and mm -hmm. each with their own systems, each with their own ideals and philosophies. And then there was a time when the U.S. was more or less rule, ruled by a monarchy for, for a great portion of it. Uh, and there was a time when the U.S. became a, a bourgeois democracy, which is what we're living in still. Mm -hmm. But just in the same geography across time, the system has not always been the same. Uh, even with the same generations of people, mm -hmm. the systems change over time. It's, right. it's, it's natural. There's no, there's no one, you know, natural state of man and, and anything beyond that is, is unnatural progression. There's no natural progression to the way things that the way things go. It doesn't always go from tribes to chiefdoms to, uh, you know, I forgot what unabsolute monarchy means, but, and then to, to absolute monarchy and then, you know, then into capitalism and, you know, as Marx was hoping, inevitably into socialism. No, th there's no inevitability to it. it. It all depends on people's decisions. It depends on a lot of different actions by a lot of different people. Um, so fortunately and, and unfortunately, there is no natural progression of things. There's no one way that things have to go. Geography shapes a lot of things. Uh, material conditions shape a lot of things, but they don't shape everything. There's still human will and, and human agency. Um, so yeah, but for, for a good book on, on the idea that there is no one way that people were, and now we are a different way, just inevitably, I recommend David Graeber's latest book, um, the, the Dawn of Everything. It goes into that quite extensively. Different configurations throughout time and space around the world. No one way of doing things. No inevitable way of doing things. So it's important to keep that in mind. So uh, that, 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 that's a swing and a miss by Berkman right there, calling it the hatchet age. Uh, the idea that there was a time of... of you know, such great scarcity that, that people had to be violent to one another. And if we have abundance, well, then by, by default, we have to be good to one another because we live in abundance now. We have way over abundance of food and shelter 
and and any material resource that one could want. Mm -hmm. But we choose to unequally distribute those gains. Right. And that power to acquire those gains. So I was like thinking about places sell bottled water. Bottled water. Right. That's a that has to be a choice. There's no necessity like, for bottled water. Right. To me, that's just like the dumbest thing. Yep. I agree. Or like the women have to pay for feminine hygiene products. Sure. That again that's is a like choice. Medically necessary. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, we it's don't not, live in a society where you can't just choose to free bleed. Free bleed yeah. Is acceptable. No. If you went into work like that, you would probably get sent home. I, I would, I would guess so. I would, I would hope so. That's, that's, that could create pretty, uh, pretty awful working conditions. If you know, just openly bleeding there, it's not going to be a pleasant sight. Probably not going to be a pleasant work environment in any way for anybody, uh, you know, not least of which the people experiencing that, because I'm sure that's an awful thing to have to go through. So there we go. Again, choice. There is choice in the system. Mm -hmm. And the more we work together, uh, the more we can make more of those choices ourselves instead of allowing others to do it for us. Right. Force we shall have to force and violence. The more enlightened man will become, the less he will employ compulsion and coercion. The really civilized man will divest himself of all fear and authority. He will rise from the dust and stand erect. He will bow to no czar, either in heaven or on earth. He will become fully human when he will scorn to rule and refuse to be ruled. He will be truly free only when there shall be no more masters. Anarchism is the ideal of such a condition, of a society without force and compulsion, where all men shall be equals and live in peace, freedom, and harmony. The word anarchy comes from the Greek meaning without force, without violence, or government, because government is the very fountainhead of violence, constraint, and coercion. Anarchy, therefore, does not mean disorder and chaos, as you had thought before. On the contrary, it is the very reverse of it. It means no government, which is freedom and liberty. Disorder is the child of authority and compulsion. Liberty is the mother of order. I overall agree with his sentiment there, the idea that anarchy is the opposite of, of uh, coercive force. But what is that? Hmm. What was that scratching sound? Like we, got. we got mice. Great. <sighs> I love renting. <laughs> Anyway, uh, in the radiator. It sounded like it was in that wall. Something's coming from the neighbors. But anyway, getting back to this, uh, so I, I would take a little bit of issue. I, I'd modify his statement just a little bit. For one thing, there is no such thing as living without any sort of government. Government is any time people are collectively or collectively or individually making decisions about rules for things. It can be as informal as a family. It could be as formal as, you know, a totalitarian, top-down, uh, absolute monarch. Um, so government is just how people make decisions, either together or in a, in a small group, or ideally with anarchy amongst as many people as possible. Uh, decisions about how we're going to balance rights that we all have with one another. Um, whether proactively or reactively. I don't see anything back there. That is really obnoxious. We're going to have to put a trap in there. Um, anyway, so yeah, I would take a little bit of issue with that. Um, and, and he also said that, that anarchy is without compulsion of any kind and and well i would say it's true that it is the least amount of compulsion that one could possibly have in a system 
as we've been discussing, there, there can be no system that completely does away with compulsion because we are curtailing some individual absolute rights, rights to dominate one another, that is a curtailing of rights. So if there are people that still want to do that, which there is bound to be in any system, there's always going to be, at the very least, contrarians who just want to do stuff different because, you know, it makes them look cool or, or just they're like, they're, a teenager. they're like triggering other people or they're a teenager. Yeah. But we're not going to allow them to do that. Right. It's, it's kind of like the paradox of tolerance. If you tolerate absolutely anything, including extreme intolerance, eventually you allow extreme intolerance to win out because they don't care about dominating other people. They don't care about compelling others to do what they want. That's, that is what they want to do. They don't feel bad about that in the least. So it's the same sort of thing. If we're going to have a system that, that spreads out power as much as possible, it will require constant vigilance to at least some extent. And, and, and as we've said, well, if people's basic needs, needs are met, there's going to be a lot less desire for people to dominate one another. There's going to be a lot less people who, who feel that they are pushed into resorting to you know, antisocial practices in order to survive. So that right there takes out a huge chunk of the violence inherent in the system. It's not complete, especially if we are one region or one nation out of the world that is behaving this way. Because we live in a global system that is still dependent on global trade, there may be instances where even a, a, the most anarchist society you can think of still relies on goods and services from areas that are less so. And therefore is is perpetuating, even if it's out of necessity, violence and coercion on a greater scale than it enjoys or, or than it than it even tolerates under its own system. So there's that aspect of it as well. But overall, a pretty good statement by him. Anarchy is is, is the least amount of coercion, anarchy is the most amount of liber liberty for the most amount of people. Seeds of, of liberty in relative terms. How much liberty can we give to everyone until it gets to the point where giving them more liberty means that they are curtailing the liberty of others? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. cool. Do you have anything else to add? We're yeah. almost done with the chapter here. A right. beautiful Bounce. idea, you say. Oh, okay. But only angels are That's fit fun. for it. Let us see then if we can grow the wings we need for the ideal state of society. Yeah, there we go. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. Really great service. Can't can't recommend them enough. Let's move to the next chapter. How long is your next chapter? It's short. It's only eight minutes and 20 seconds. Okay. See you at nine. Okay. Thank you for being on the show. Say goodnight, everybody, to, to Amanda. Thanks for being with us. Is that gonna be your exit music now? I don't yeah. I don't I don't have uh, rights though. I don't want to get copyright struck. Who do you? Ba, 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 ba. No, okay, really, but really don't no, sing that. I enough. do in a different No no but really though, YouTube oh. is really picky about that. Even if you're singing the song yourself, you can still get struck for it. So okay. yeah. I'm just rolling my eyes in my head. I, this is the, the freedom that capitalism affords us, though. Yeah, so free. The freedom to sue one another for rights to that, ideas. It's been scratchy outside. I don't think it was scratchy in here. Scratchy? Oh, oh, you think that? Oh, you think it was coming from outside? Like the snow. Like it could be a squirrel or something. Yeah. I sure hope so. Hey, Have a good that? rest of your night. Good night. I will. All right, so now we're going to get into the chapter called What is Anarchism? Which, again, seems like it should be the first chapter, but I guess he's saving he's saving it for the, the latter half of the book. Uh, I looked. We have, I think, now seven chapters, seven or eight chapters left after, after we're done with this one, maybe even as little as six. I don't, I don't remember exactly what I counted. 
if it was including the ones we we're on or not. But but still, we have probably about a month to go in this book, so that's ex that's exciting. Getting towards the end of it here. Um, so yeah, let, let's hear what is anarchism. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. And as usual, I will give you the link to this particular video so that you can uh, listen to it or watch it at your leisure. I'll pop that in the chat right now. Chapter 20. What is anarchism? Can you tell us briefly, your friend asks, what anarchism really is? I shall try. In the fewest words, anarchism teaches us that we can live in a society where there is no compulsion of any kind. A life without compulsion can... It may be a little bit of a pedantic point, because is there really a difference between as little compulsion as possible and no compulsion? Functionally, probably not really. Um, but I, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, not, not put on pretenses that we're somehow absolutely doing away with all compulsion. Uh, because I don't think that is a, a, a possible thing. And I, I think just taking a more... Uh, a more factual look at the at the case is is important when we're trying to make our case to others. So if they say, "Oh, you just believe in a fairy tale where there's no compulsion and no one ever tells anyone what to do," you can then say, "No, that's that's not exactly what I want. We just want as least uh, the amount of compulsion as possible to still have a functioning society, and we want the most freedom for the most people." balanced by everyone's ability to exercise the same rights and freedoms. Naturally means liberty. It means freedom. Freedom from being forced or coerced. A chance to lead a life that suits you best. You cannot lead such a life unless you do away with the institutions that curtail your liberty and interfere with your life. The conditions that compel you to act differently from the way that you would like to. What are those institutions and conditions? Let us see what we have to do away with in order to secure a free and harmonious life. Once we know what has to be abandoned and abolished and what must take its place, we shall also find out a way to do it. What must be abolished then to a secure liberty? First of all, of course, the thing that invades you the most, that handicaps or prevents your free activity. The thing that interferes with your liberty and compels you to live differently from what you would be on your own choice. That thing is government. Take a good look at it. It is government if you include private institutions as a form of government too, which I would. I think they function just the same as government. They just happen to be subordinate to the rules and regulations of the city, the county, the, the state and the nation that they are in. But functionally, they, they make decisions. Uh, they have similar structures to a government. It just happens to be that under capitalism, the structure is top-down authoritarian. And that's what we want to get away from. We want more democracy, uh, even in the workplace. Well, in, in some regards, especially in the workplace, because that is the place that affects your daily life the most and that potentially you could have the most influence and effect on. And you will see that government is the greatest invader. More than that, the worst criminal man has ever known of. It fills the world with violence, with fraud and deceit, with oppression and misery. As a great thinker once said, And again, especially with, with capitalist countries, oftentimes, or oftentimes the, the, that government is working hand in glove, or, or let's flip that around, uh, capitalist interests are working as, as basically the puppeteer of the government with their influence. Wars are, are fought for capitalist reasons. Um, policies, laws are instituted for capitalist reasons. So it's still maybe the government who is the final arbiter but it is most often at the behest of 
the capitalist class. So to say, to say that, that government is all responsible, kind of true, but at the same time, you can't ignore what's behind all of that action. Its breath is poison. It corrupts everything it touches. Yes, government means violence, and it is evil, you admit. But can we do without it? That is just what we want to talk over. Now, if I should ask you whether you need government, I'm sure you would answer that you don't, but it is for the others that it is needed. But if you should ask one of those others, he would reply as you do. He would say that he does not need it, but it is necessary for the others. So, so, so here is a, a pretty common core anarchist belief. It's that people just left to their own devices, on average, don't really need to have a lot of laws imposed upon them. They want to act well towards each other. They don't wish to harm one another. And they don't wish to dominate one another, by and large. Uh, it's not the case absolutely. There are individuals who, who go against that. But by and large, people, I mean, just think about your daily life. In your daily life, do you have policemen coming in and, and telling you exactly how you need to drive at, at every bit of the way that you go? Do, are they directing, you know, as, as you walk across every uh, intersection? Um, do, you, do you need to have your boss literally breathing down your neck in order to do your work? Most people just do what they need to do. They get along just fine or relatively fine, you know. I'm not talking about minor disputes like, you know, your neighbors being annoying and too loud or something like that. I'm talking about major conflicts. Most of life is, is not major conflicts for most people, uh, especially without um, coercive influences such as, as the private sector and uh, through them, government. So, I mean, just think about being in a family. Most families, you don't have to constantly be laying down the law for every little thing, for every person. Uh, families tend, on average, to get along without, you know, a lot of coercion or violence or, or anything like that. Um, yeah, I mean, people are cooperative social animals by nature. Not every single one of them, but but by and large, that seems to be the case. We, we just naturally like to work together. We like to be together. That is one of the things that has made us so successful as a species. We're not solitary animals, by and large. There are, of course, again, always exceptions, but by and large, we are social creatures that do best when we work together. And for that reason, you know, it's it's a lot easier to see the, the the default position of humanity, if there is such a thing, as being more on the side of at least, you know, benign goodness. Not 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 necessarily even. Uh, it's not as though we're always acting for good in every thing that we do, but but just not harming one another. You can be pretty confident walking out into a crowd of strangers that the vast majority of the people you meet have no bear no threat to you at all. Uh, would would not harm you even if they were in the position to do so. So so this is this is kind of what he's getting at here. Why does everyone think that he can be decent enough without the policemen, but the club is needed for the others? People would rob and murder each other if there was no government and no law, you say. If they really would, why would they? Would they do it just for the pleasure of it? Or because of certain reasons? Maybe if we examine their reasons, we discover the cure for them. Suppose you and I and a score of others had suffered shipwreck and found ourselves on an island rich oh with fruit of every kind. Oh boy. <laughs> It looks like we're taking a trip to Coconut Island. Of course, we get to work and gather the food.
But suppose one of our number should declare that it all belongs to him. Interesting. That no one shall have a single morsel unless he first pays tribute for it. We would be indignant, wouldn't we? We'd laugh at his pretensions. If he'd try to make trouble about it, we might throw him into the sea, and it would serve him right, would it not? Suppose further that we ourselves and our forefathers had cultivated the island and stocked it with everything we needed for life and comfort, and someone should arrive and claim it all as his, what would we say? We'd ignore him, wouldn't we? We might tell him that he could share with us and join us in our work, but suppose that he insists on his ownership and that he produces a slip of paper that says he pr that proves everything belongs to him. We'd tell him he's crazy and we'd go about our business. But should he have a government back him, he would appeal to it for the protection of his rights and the government would send police and soldiers who would evict us and put the lawful owner in possession. That is the function of government. That is what the government exists for and what it is doing all the time. Yeah, that's a big part of what the government does, especially the, the coercive forms of, of government, the more coercive forms of government, sure. Um, but think back to just a couple paragraphs before when he said, imagine we're on this island and, and there's enough for everybody, but one person tries to hoard it all. They would be thrown into the sea, aka kicked off the island at the very least, if not killed. I mean, it depends on how many other islands are nearby, depends on a lot of things, but the implication is that force is done to them. So again, in that society, there's there's very little coercion, there's very little force, because most people just get along and they're fine. But for that one person, there there had to be coercion, there had to be force, there had to be violence done to them for the good of everybody else. Because if that person had their way, they could inflict tremendous violence above and beyond what was what was done to him and at the same time he could avoid all of that violence just by trying to get along despite his his own desires with everybody else not 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 as much so the other way around if one person hoards everything then more than likely there's going to be other people among that group that they don't find any use for and no matter how much they try to cozy up to them they're going to be violent towards them, allow them to starve, kick them out, have other people do violence to them in order to get more. Um, yeah, I, I like the example that he's talking about now where we have an island where our, our forebears have built up everything that, that one needs to survive. Because that is, you know, in a very general sense, the, what we have now. We We live as benefactors of a wealth of resources that have been built up for hundreds, thousands of generations of human beings, one after another. No one person alive today invented every single thing that they use on a daily basis. That's just impossible. Not, no one alive today made even all of the tools that they use on a daily basis. Uh, but even if they did, they would still have gotten that knowledge of tool making from generations immemorial. We are all the inheritors of all of the, the collected wealth of knowledge and material of everyone that's come before us. It's just that some people have cordoned off large sections of those gains for themselves in the name of their own enrichment. And really, that, that's all there is to it. Um, so he's making a case that there's no justification for that sort of a system to happen because it, by rights, should, it should be as Peter Kropotkin said, all for all. Now, do you still think that without this thing called government, we would rob and murder each other? Is it not true that with government, we rob and murder? Because government does not secure us in our rightful possessions, but on the contrary, takes them away for the benefit of those who have no right to them, as we have seen in previous chapters. If you should wake up tomorrow morning and learn there is no government anymore, would your first thought be to rush out to the street and kill someone? No, you know that is not... For, for the vast, vast majority of people, that is true. 
again, I hate, I hate being a stickler for this, but there are obviously some that would make that choice. There's some people that, that are just so violent inclined or have been maybe pushed so much by a particular person that if there were no rules and no consequences, they might go out and do that sort of thing. So we have to plan accordingly to, to deal with these edge cases. Nonsense. We speak of sane, normal men. The insane man who wants to kill does not first ask whether or not there is any government. Such men belong to the care of physicians. They should be placed in hospitals to be treated for their malady. The chances are that if you or Johnson should awaken to find that there is no government, that you would get busy arranging your life under the new conditions. It is very likely, of course, that if you should see people gorge themselves while you go hungry, you would demand a chance to eat, and you would be perfectly right in that. And so would everyone else, which means that people would not stand for anyone hogging all the good things of life. They would want to share in them. It further means that the poor would refuse to stay poor while others wallow in luxury. It means that the worker will decline to give up his product to the boss who claims to own the factory and everything that is made there. It means that the farmer will not permit thousands of his acres to lie idle while he hasn't enough soil to support himself and his family. It means that no one will be permitted to monopolize the land or the machinery of production. It means that private ownership of the sources of life will not be tolerated anymore. It will be considered the greatest crime for someone to own more than they can use in a dozen lifetimes while their neighbors have not enough bread for their children. It means I, I think that's a, a common enough sen sentiment in, in this day and age that uh, I, I, you know, I, I think most people would, would agree to that right now. The idea that there's no justification for people like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, any of these, these multi, multi, multi billionaires to have as much as they do. Well, there are people that go hungry, uh, people that are food insecure, people that, that, that starve in many parts of the world. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that's a little bit of a hopeful note to me. I, I think we are at that stage. We are, you know, collectively have agreed on on that much at least in our society. Uh, it's it's more or less an, a, a matter of collectively acting to change things towards a system that is the opposite of that, where everyone has enough of at least the basics. And uh, nobody starves. No one falls through the cracks. Oh, uh, that's helpful. It means that all men will share in the social wealth and all will help to produce that wealth. It means, in short, that for the first time in history, right, justice, and equality should triumph instead of law. You see, therefore, that doing away with government also signifies the abolition of monopoly and of personal ownership of the means of production and distribution. It follows that when government is abolished, wage slavery and capitalism must also go with it, because they cannot exist without the support and protection of government. Just as the man who claimed a monopoly on the island, of which I spoke before, could not put through his crazy claim without the help of government. Such a condition of things, where there would be liberty instead of government, would be anarchy. And where a quality of use would take the place of private ownership would be communism. It would be communist anarchism. Oh, communism, your friend exclaims. But you said you were not a Bolshevik. No, I am not a Bolshevik, because the Bolsheviki want a powerful government or state, while anarchism means doing away with the state or government altogether. But are not the Bolsheviki communists, you demand? Yes, the Bolsheviki are communists, but they want their dictatorship, their government, to compel people to live in communism. Anarchist communism, on the contrary, means voluntary communism. Communism from free choice. I see the difference. It would be fine, of course, your friend admits. 
but do you really think it is possible? This has been a production. Okay. Oh, of Audible yeah, Anarchist. Run, I you do. can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. There you go. All right. That's a pretty good, you know, succinct overview of what communist anarchism is. Um, so that we did it. We you know no no need to keep on reading the book, right? No, I'm just kidding. We will definitely see this all the way through. Many more ideas to go through. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, again, he, I, I, I do feel that he is coming at things from a very individualist anarchist position because he's, he's not talking about organizations. He's not talking about systems of deciding what's right and what's wrong. He's, he's mostly just talking about anarchism in the philosophical sense of no one having the right to dominate anyone else, basically. No one having the right to lord it over anyone else or resources. And I think that's that's a very important point. I think that's something that I really think leftists should uh, hone in on a lot more, the idea of hoarding, because the 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 retort is always from the capitalist, you know, oh well, who are you to stop people from earning more? Well, if you you can't put a cap on the upper limits of what people can achieve, that's just gonna stifle production and stuff like that. Well if accumulating all of that means hoarding a bunch of resources at the expense of other people even having access to them, that seems like a good reason to put a cap on the upper limits of what people can take for themselves. No one should be able to hoard so much that they can do things like distort the government, uh, control all of the housing, um, control all of the jobs even. It, these, these are very dangerous situations to be in because it it it, uh, it makes the conditions right for further exploitation. You know, you can extract all kinds of favors if you control all of a resource. Um, yeah, yeah, that, I like these last two chapters. They were pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. I hope he gets into organizing more, though. Let's see what the next few chapters are going to look like. Let me just quickly take a look. So that that last one was, what is anarchism? Next week, we will cover, is anarchy possible? And then we have a longer chapter called, will anarchist communism work? Let's see what's why revolution. The idea is the thing. See, I get, yeah, that seems to be the individualist perspective. More about being philosophically anarchist and acting yourself in ways that, that support that rather than collective action or setting up systems that would be more fair uh, to make decisions collectively. It, it seems like the idea is the thing, as you said. <laughs> It is more about having the right idea of anarchism. Which I disagree with. I don't think that should be the focus. I think sharing power, acknowledging power, acknowledging coercion, and working to reduce the, the need for coercion as much as possible uh, through systematic collective action, that should be the focus. Much more so than just getting your own personal philosophy right, uh, or personally acting in a anarchist or communist anarchist way. And there's preparation. We want an organization of labor and the social revolution. Okay, so he is going to get to organization a little bit. Principles and practice. Consumption and exchange. Production. And then it, it caps off the whole thing of defense of the revolution. Very cool. So, so some good stuff coming up. I think he's he saved the best for the last part of the book here. Um, although it, it was valuable insights into how he looked at the the Bolshevik revolution, that was good stuff. 
Let's see now. Just looking back over what we've been through already. Yeah, that was mostly justification for why anarchism is important. And, you know, describing the system as it is. And the problems with capitalism. Yeah, okay. So now we're getting more into the answering the 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 main question of the book of, of what anarchism actually looks like. So yeah, good good times ahead. And uh, as I've mentioned in, in previous streams, once we get through this book, we're going to take some time to look at a bunch of different authors. We're going to focus more on essays for a while so that we can get a broader base because it does take a while. You know, I'm, I'm just doing this as a hobby. I'm doing this on my free time. So it's not as though I can get through a book a week. You know, I mean, if you do want me to be able to get to a position where I can cover more books more quickly, if you really like this sort of thing, the best way to get me to that point where we can start going through stuff more quickly is to support me on Patreon. Uh, we have a $5 a month level, uh, the Kropotkin level. And if I can get enough people doing that, then I can start making this maybe even a part-time job, maybe even eventually a full-time job. And then we could really be getting through stuff quickly. I could, If I was putting 40 hours a week into streaming, we could really cover a lot. But for now, I think the best strategy, because I have limited time, is to instead of taking weeks and months to cover uh, single books, to look at a whole bunch of different essays so we can really broaden our base of thinkers, broaden our base of knowledge. So we'll be doing Mao and Rosa Luxemburg and Emma Goldman and Malatesta and um, let's see, who are some other ones that we're going to look at? We'll look at Bookchin, Murray Bookchin. We're going to cover uh, the the book that was most influential. It was the first book that that Abdullah uh, Ajlan, the, the leader of the, the Rojava, or the leader of the, the movement in Rojava that uh, influenced him the most. We'll look at that one. Maybe we'll do that, that book that I was talking about earlier, The, the Politics of Social Democracy, uh, and the subtitle being uh, Libertarian Municipalism. That was a really interesting read. That was a little, that, that would take a few weeks to cover, so maybe it, we'll put that off for a little while. But we're going to do a lot of essays next so that we can get that broader base and get some more ideas and people into the mix. Because my idea for this all, for this whole stream as a whole, is to move in phases. So now we're kind of in the classic section of things. If we were to look at this in terms of, say, a course of study, usually you start with the classics. You get your foundational stuff out there, the, the main principles of whatever philosophy you're studying, you know, whether that's social sciences, whether that is hard sciences, whether that's, you know, art or literature or whatever it may be, generally people start with the foundational stuff and foundational stuff tends to have been done uh, in the distant past. Uh, you know, these are things that have stood the test of time that, that people still come back to time and time again because they, they still find meaning an application for today. So that's kind of where we're at right now. So I want to I want to start moving towards wrapping up this section. We will cap off the classics with the big one, Das Kapital. We'll do at least volume one and probably volume two. At that point, we're going to have to make a decision together because that's going to take a long, long time. I don't even know how many chapters there there are between those two volumes or how long they are uh, in total but it's tens of hours dozens of hours I, I i'm not quite sure but it's going to be a long time to get through that stuff but i think it's a good way to really cap off the classics with one of the most in-depth works critiquing capitalism that there has ever been uh so once we get past that phase, we're going to start moving into more, we're going to start bringing in more voices, voices that we have not heard from yet at all. Like you know, so far in, in this series, we have only done books by white men. So that is, that is a, 
a deficiency that we will correct. We'll get much more perspectives. We'll get perspectives from outside of the U.S. And we'll start moving into more contemporary stuff, or, or at least the, the recent history. We'll study things like the Black Panther movement. Uh, we will study various movements for liberation. We'll start to get into things like... Um, yeah, we, we may even get to the point where we're into much more recent history. We'll, we'll study things like the EZLN movement, the Zapatistas. Uh, we will study what happened and what is still ongoing with them and Rojava. We will look at places like Cuba. Uh, we'll start to get in to more closely examining some of the best examples of, of you know, left-wing movements in action and coming closer and closer to the ideals of socialism. Um, so that's my idea. That's the idea for phase two, is to bring in a whole lot more strands of things and not just look strictly at leftist political philosophy, but look at a more broadly liberatory set of philosophies. Uh, we may even bring in things like uh, liberation theology. Uh, we may look at, at a whole lot of different things, but the idea will be to really weave in a whole bunch of strands. Like right now, we're, we're basically in the black and white times. Um, but we really need to add a lot more color eventually, or to, if we're going to have any any tapestry worth of or a built of of ideas and theories that is is worth holding on to in the end. And then for phase three, this is just a thumbnail sketch at this point. In phase three, we'll start to develop our own ideas about all of this stuff. We'll start to articulate these things in ways that make sense for us. Um, we'll get into ideas of, of actually starting to put these ideas into practice. How do you start a group? How do you start a movement? Uh, what are some pitfalls that we need to look out for? What are some ways to not leave any voices behind? That, that, that's my, my, my kind of thumbnail sketch vision for phase three, but we're a long way from there yet. A lot more time to go just in the classics, in fact. But yeah, that's, that's the overall idea. All right, I think I will wrap it up for the night. Uh, thank you all for joining me. I don't think I have all that many people watching right at the moment, so I don't know that we'll raid into any channel that uh other than perhaps channels that are on all the time so there, there are a few channels on twitch that are just on all the time and they're always putting out content moving train radio is one that i, I like to do a lot uh, that's a great online twitch radio station that plays um folk songs and covers politics and and all sorts of cool stuff but I think I've done MST3K recently, but I have not done Riff Tracks. And that's another one that is often on. That is not a, a, an actively managed channel, I'll put it that way. But it's a one that you guys, I think, will find a lot of value in. Uh, if you like Mystery Science Theater, you're definitely going to like Riff Tracks. Here's the link to that one. In case you're watching this after the fact, which tends to be the trend, I always get a lot more views after the fact than I do during the live event. And, uh, you know, if you're watching this and, and you want to give me some feedback on why that might be, if perhaps my schedule is off of yours, if there's, a, if there's more convenient times that, that I should be doing it live, or if it's just you enjoy doing, you know, passively listening to it at work or, you know, uh, while you're doing chores or whatever. Um, I would love to know what the what the reason is because that definitely is the dominant way that that my content is consumed. It's it's after the fact, which is is great. I, I'm so uh, proud of the work that I do that it that it's it's good enough for a lot of people to to want to listen to at any time, even if it's not live. But I'd just be curious to know what 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 the answers would be, and if there's anything I could do to kind of tweak my schedule to include more people in the the live events. Because it's always more fun when more people are in here. So, so yeah. All right. Well, we will go ahead and, and raid into Rift Tracks right now. 
left the link for them already. Don't forget if you are a leftist creator to come over to facebook.com slash left signal boost and sign up to be part of our creator collective. If you do live streams, if you do videos, even if you do podcasts, uh, we're trying to get a, a separate collective going for podcasts, but there's no reason you couldn't join uh, left signal boost TV collective as well. But we're all just, it, it's, it, we're all voluntarily submitting our work to the same page. Uh, we all go live from this page. You could be watching it from this page from Left Signal Boost TV right now, in fact. Um, the idea is just to share an audience, to share our promotions, and to help each other out as, as comrades. And that's really all there is to it. There's no, there's, no, there's no requirements if you join to post any certain amount of times, to, to go live any certain amount of times. It's all just kind of up to you and what you want to contribute. Um, and then and that's it. We don't, we don't, you know, we're not going to make any claims on your content. You're, you're free to put it up and take it down at will. Uh, it's just a way for us to help each other out. And that's, and that's really it. So come on, check it out. And also go follow that channel too on Facebook. Facebook.com slash left signal boost. Take you right to it. No, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to raid a channel. Go check out Rift Tracks. Fun times always. See you guys uh, this Friday for more of the SJ Witcher. Should be a good time.